Welcome to Jubilee Campaign's side event to the United Nations General Assembly Third Committee, which is entitled Stemming the Role of Criminal Groups in Contemporary Slavery Within Nigeria with a Focus on Women and Children. My name is Anne Bowalda. I'm the Executive Director of Jubilee Campaign USA. And uh, our organization has consultative status with the United Nations, and we're pleased to present this uh, webinar in conjunction with um, the Sovereign Order of Malta. We're very grateful for their participation in co-sponsoring this event. And uh, we also would like to encourage our viewers to submit any questions that they have by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Without further ado, I will now introduce today's event. UNICEF reports that criminal gangs have abducted 1,400 Nigerian children with 16 children dead in 2021 alone, and more than 200 still missing. The International Committee on Nigeria, ICON, has as of June 2021 20, reported over 2,500 individuals abducted and almost 2,200 killed by Boko Haram, the Islamic State, the West Africa province, ISWAP, radical Fulani militants, and other criminal groups. A large portion of those abducted are women and girls who are then subjected to domestic servitude, sexual slavery, forced marriage, and even coerced religious conversions. As UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery, including its causes and consequences, Mr. Toyoma Obokata has presented his reports, reports specifically on the role of organized criminal groups with regards to contemporary forms of slavery earlier this week. And we'll be putting that report in uh, the chat for, for participants to be able to access that. Jubilee Campaign finds it essential that we raise the astounding frequency of mass kidnappings of predominantly school children and women in Nigeria. We believe these are targeted attacks. And we would also like to announce that Jubilee Campaign has published our own report entitled Kidnapping and Slavery in Nigeria to coincide with today's event. We'll be having that uh, report also available uh, through the chat function. And later we'll um, be, be releasing this report as well, making it widely available. We will be, um, um, our report provides both general information such as what constitutes slavery and slavery-like conditions and more specific information with regards to Nigeria, including historical forms of slavery in the nation and broader region, as well as modern forms of slavery perpetrated by criminal groups such as Boko Haram. We encourage you all to read it and to share it with anyone who would like to know more information. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator for today, um, His Excellency Professor Michel Vote, Ambassador at Large of the Sovereign Order of Malta will be monitoring and combating trafficking in persons. He also serves as Deputy Permanent Observer of the mission of the Order of Malta to the United Nations in Geneva, and he's joining us today from Geneva. Ambassador Voite holds a doctorate of law from the University of Geneva and a diploma from the Hague Academy of International Law and is a professor of international humanitarian law. He has a wealth of hands-on experience in international humanitarian diplomacy, having spent most of his career at the International Committee of the Red Cross. We now welcome Ambassador Vote to moderate our event and thank you once again, Your Excellency. The, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Buwalda. Uh, on behalf of the Sovereign Order of Malta, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, you as a Jubilee campaign for organizing this uh, important side event and for uh, bringing together all those witnesses and also uh, the expertise of uh, Professor Obakata. Um, and briefly, allow me to say uh, what uh, the Order of Malta uh, does. 
uh, obviously we assist vulnerable people around the world, uh, including uh, um, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, specifically uh, for uh, victims of human trafficking. I can tell you that uh, we do that in, in five uh, uh, ways. Five approaches, the first one, raising awareness, raising awareness through our bilateral network. We have uh, diplomatic relations with uh, uh, more than 110 uh, states uh, through our multilateral diplomatic network, especially uh, at the UN, in New York, in Geneva, uh, at the European Union, in Brussels, and uh, in other places. And also, we organized uh, in October 2019 a conference in Paris with international experts precisely on uh, uh, victims of uh, human trafficking between Nigeria and Europe. And uh, uh, we organized this conference to try to uh, uh, bring together uh, people from Nigeria and people from France, uh, people from Nigeria, not only from uh, uh, the federal government, but also uh, from the provinces, not only diplomats, because uh, obviously the ambassador of Nigeria in Paris was there, but also people coming from uh, 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 the northern provinces and uh, also bringing um, together also religious people, beginning with uh, Sister uh, Patricia, uh, who, uh, as uh, I will tell you, uh, is uh, uh, directing uh, a pilot project in Lagos, the Bakita Center. Sister Patricia uh, ebek Boulem uh, of the Sister of St. Louis. Uh, indeed, that's uh, uh, our concrete action in Nigeria on behalf of uh, uh, victims of uh, human trafficking. And we do, of course, also assist victims through medical and social programs, including in Nigeria uh, with Maltese International, and uh, uh, online training in English and in French, cuhd.org, uh, Collège Universitaire Henri Dunant, and also in partnership with uh, the University of Webster, Geneva, where we organized uh, actually um, a conference on the use and abuse of high technology in human trafficking, and the University of Nice in Southern France uh, where we uh, started last year, and we shall be going on uh, next year, with a legal clinic on the implementation of the European Union directives uh, on combating uh, human trafficking. And also the fourth uh, approach is uh, we organize uh, 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 webinars uh, to this day 14, one four, on human trafficking you can find them on this uh, website, adlauda2c.org, uh, usually in English, but all of them with English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish subtitles. And uh, we do that in collaboration with Sister Miriam Baike uh, uh, of the community of the Sister of Our Lady of the Charity of the Good Shepherd. And uh, uh, then the fifth and not the least, of course, is a spiritual uh, uh, layer, and this spiritual approach is uh, uh, participating in the World Day of Prayer against human trafficking. As many of you know, it's the 8th of February, uh, uh, the feast day of Saint Bakita. So uh, uh, that's uh, what uh, we are uh, doing in a nutshell, and uh, uh, then uh, to tell you uh, the truth, we are trying to develop our partnerships, uh, and we will be very happy to go on with, uh, uh, with this. Uh, I could briefly give you the, the list, uh, that's the second slide, if you don't mind, uh, the, the list uh, of uh, uh, actually webinars on human trafficking, you can find the videos all of them accessible through uh, adlatc.org. And you see uh, the first two were on religious helping trafficking victims, the second working in international uh, advocacy, 
and then uh, describing trauma, describing uh, the uh, healing process, and then also some legal approaches, three webinars on uh, international prosecution, uh, then switching to demand as a root cause, uh, then technology, and then legal aspects, uh, uh, humanitarian and social assistance, modern slavery and decent work, and the last one on the 12th of October, legal approaches to reducing the demand behind human trafficking and especially on public procurement. But uh, uh, that's all uh, what I would like uh, to tell you uh, uh, for uh, the uh, time being. And I'm uh, uh, very happy and, and grateful actually to be uh, uh, with you today and uh, to have uh, uh, this opportunity also uh, to work uh, 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 with you and also with Professor Bokata because I, uh, uh, I must say, like I'd say, uh, I had uh, uh, have a great respect for his uh, 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 work for many years, even before he joined the UN as a UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery. He was very active also in doing research on, on this topic. And, uh, and so that's why uh, um, uh, I briefly, I would say, Professor Bokata is a Japanese scholar of international law and human rights. He specializes in transnational organized crime, human trafficking, and modern slavery. Has an experience, extensive experience working on these issues with uh, uh, relevant stakeholders, including the UK Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, the Northern Ireland Assembly All Party Group on Human Trafficking, and UNODC, the UN. United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the European Union, and more. So, Professor Bokata, uh, very honored and very happy to have you. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like you uh, uh, now to take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for, for that kind introduction. And it is an honor for me to participate in today's virtual side event on stemming the role of criminal groups in contemporary slavery within Nigeria with a focus on women and children. I wish to thank the Jubilee Campaign and the Sovereign Order of Malta for sponsoring this event and for inviting me. I will provide a brief overview of my report presented to the third committee of the General Assembly two days ago, focusing on the role of organized criminal groups in contemporary forms of slavery. The report itself takes a global perspective, but I shall pinpoint particularly those aspects which are relevant to Nigeria, in addition to some other points which I wish to bring to the table. You may not be surprised to hear that the involvement of organized criminal groups in contemporary forms of slavery is evident in all regions of the world, and Nigeria is no exception in this regard. The Black Axe, for example, operates globally and Boko Haram act is active in various parts, various countries of the sub-region. As the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria mentioned in a submission made for my report, women and girls are trafficked from various parts of Nigeria to the Middle East and elsewhere for domestic and sexual servitude. Jointly with other special rapporteurs, we issued a press statement in March this year, calling on the government to ensure urgent rehabilitation of children who had been abducted by Boko Haram. We also expressed our concern at reports that an unknown number of women and girls have been abducted in recent years and subjected to domestic servitude, forced labor, sexual slavery, forced marriage, as well as forced and unwanted pregnancies. In my thematic study, I assessed three key actions to address the involvement of organized criminal groups. The criminalization of their participation in contemporary forms of slavery, intelligence-led law enforcement, and financial investigations and the confiscations of criminal proceeds. While the Nigerian criminal law provides for an offense of conspiracy which can be used to punish participation of criminal groups or associations. It does not seem to provide a definition of organized crime or criminal group or enhanced punishment for their involvement. 
Perhaps Nigeria could consider adopting a legal definition in line with the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. I note, however, that the Trafficking in Persons Enforcement and Administration Act of 2015 covers offenses like forced labor, domestic servitude of minors, and slave dealing, and this is an example of good practice. I also acknowledge that the Lawful Intersection of Communications regulation or Regulations of 2019 provides some safeguards against abuse and misuse. And this is also important to protect due process, privacy, and other human rights. In relation to financial investigations and the confiscation of criminal proceeds, the aforementioned Trafficking Act of 2015 has provisions on these, particularly criminal asset recovery where proceeds can be confiscated after perpetrators have been convicted. In addition, the Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Fraud Related Offenses Act of 2006 allows civil asset recovery where confiscation can happen before conviction under certain circumstances. In my report, I also stress the importance of using criminal proceeds to protect victims and witnesses, as commonly there are insufficient resources allocated to this end. In this regard, it is commendable that Nigeria has established a specific fund for victims of human trafficking and contemporary forms of slavery, and criminal proceeds are indeed channeled into this. In addition to these key areas, I have made a series of recommendations to tackle the involvement of organized criminal groups in contemporary forms of slavery. First and foremost, states must strengthen their actions against corruption and obstruction of justice more effectively. All too often, impunity for organized criminal groups facilitated by these practices prevails and victims face obstacles in accessing justice as is also the case in Nigeria. I also call upon financial institutions and other entities which may come in contact with criminal process to enhance identification and reporting of suspicious financial transactions in order to prevent money laundering. Unfortunately, a lack of rigorous reporting is evident in all regions of the world and states should implement more effective awareness raising and training among these private entities and also strengthen communications and coordination with them. Also, the non-punishment principle should be extended to victims who are forced to engage in criminal activities and may be subjected to sexual and or labor exploitation in addition to the victims of human trafficking. This means that victims or survivors of contemporary forms of slavery should not be punished for slavery related crimes committed if they were forced to do so. It is commendable that the 2015 Trafficking Act recognizes indeed the non-punishment principle in Nigeria. In addition, the national human rights institutions and civil society organizations play a vital role in actively monitoring the human rights compliance of states and businesses in addressing the link between organized crime and contemporary forms of slavery. I encourage the Human Rights Commission of Nigeria and relevant civil society organizations to keep up their important efforts in this regard. And last but not least, I wish to stress the importance of bringing complaints regarding the exploitation of women, girls, boys, and men at the hands of criminal groups in Nigeria to the attention of the regional and international human rights systems, including the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and my mandate on contemporary forms of slavery. I look forward to working with important colleagues in Nigeria so that together we can tackle these serious violations of human rights more effectively. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Obakata. Uh, indeed, I would like to thank the Special Rapporteur for his insightful remarks and for his commitment to uphold international human rights at the international, regional and domestic level, and especially for victims of modern slavery and human trafficking in Nigeria. 
uh, and especially, as you said, uh, women, girls, boys, and men at the hands of criminal groups in Nigeria. So thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mrs. Ellen Fisher, uh, the Global Gender Persecution Specialist with Open Doors. Over the past decade, Mrs. Fisher has tracked trends related to the often overlooked intersection of women and religious persecution. In 2018, she initiated and has since co-authored each year the annual gender-specific religious persecution analysis reports for World Watch Research, utilizing novel methodology which she and her co-author pioneered. Mrs. Fisher is a co-founder of the Gender and Religious Freedom Platform within the Religious Liberty Partnership and has been invited to speak as an expert by the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, the US Ministerial on International Religious Freedom and various government bodies from the UK, Norway and Denmark on the intersection between women's rights and freedom of religion or belief. And from 2015, 2018, Mrs. Fisher took a special interest in addressing the post-conflict situation of Christian women in Central African Republic and has helped design and implement trauma care training in conjunction with social economic development as part of a broad response to the persistent conflict situation. We now welcome Mrs. Fisher to share her remarks. Ellen, up to you. Thank you so much for your kind remarks, Your Excellency. And my greetings to panelists and guests. My special thanks to uh, the special rapporteur, Professor Obokata, for your very helpful report on the role of organized criminal groups with regard to contemporary forms of slavery. I won't pretend to, uh, to add to this expertise, nor uh, presume to give more insight into what is happening on the ground than some of our panelists, which come afterwards. I'd like to just take a few moments to try to situate the entire uh, the subject of contemporary slavery within the entirety of pressures brought to bear against a targeted, unwanted population. We'll look at this in four different quick stages. Uh, and uh, these are findings as we look through them, which will hopefully reinforce the special rapporteur's conclusions and enrich those recommendations. Firstly, let's start by picking up on what the report refers to uh, essentially as the hiddenness of criminal groups activities within other very often legal systems. It will be helpful, however, to broaden this to a consideration of other compounding situational factors and intersectionalities. Now, I recognize that this is not a new idea that populations can be vulnerable for multiple intersecting reasons, such as race, ethnicity, gender, and religion. However, the Special Rapporteur's report speaks of how hiddenness can result in significant gaps in the identification and, of, and protection of victims. And one of the interest, interesting things is that this gap that we're all concerned to fill is very complex to define because it doesn't just blend into the legal economy, but into ethnic tensions, desperate financial need, normalized gender prejudices, and a more generalized impunity for violence and abuse. In Open Doors, we frame this most often in terms of two main intersecting human rights which then become exacerbated by other elements. So there's an intersection between a person's vulnerabilities, both as a member of a religious minority, but also their vulnerabilities as either a man or a woman. And these vulnerabilities are not equal. 
In more uh, prosaic terms, we have taken to describing this as differentiating between motive for doing something, a violent action, the means by which it is accomplished, and then the opportunity which arises in the life of a given perpetrator. You can see this if you're familiar with crime dramas. This is a very simplistic and familiar formula, motive, means, and opportunity. It's the difference between the desire to murder, the choice between a gun or poison, and how difficult it is to identify those, and then whether or not the person has access to those. One of the things that we see, however, is that there are so many exacerbating factors to this. And if we were to map, for example, Nigeria, we would not be so naive as to discount the role of any overlapping identity feature of the population. So under motive, we might include financial, political, ethnic, tribal dominance issues. Under means, we would not discount the recent crisis or extreme financial need or displacement. And under um, the opportunities, obviously there are those provided by criminal and militia elements. Open Doors is not new in taking, new to taking an interest to Nigeria. In fact, World Watch Monitor has published one of our reports and did so back in 2014 uh, called Our Bodies, Their ba Battleground, which investigates this going back uh, several decades. Most recently, uh, our 2021 report entitled Same Faith, Different Persecution investigates those countries around the globe looking for patterns to know whether or not what is happening in one country is exceptional or typical of the way gen uh, religious persecution is carried out against the Christian population. Now we look at the Christian population because we have trust trusted networks there, but any faith network could do the same and we would invite them to do so. These are the countries in which we operate and you would find them on any of our websites. This year's findings put at the top of the most common uh, tactic used against women, that of forced marriage, which very often happens as a result of abduction. Human trafficking can be involved in this and this results in a form of sexual slavery. However, we do have pressure points, as we call them, specifically for abduction and trafficking, and those are not inconsequential on a global scale. In fact, they have been rising, and we saw a significant rise in those between 2020 and 2021. Uh, the special rapporteur has named many of the reasons for this, we are aware of the fact that this rise in trafficking, which very often leads to contemporary forms of slavery, is very interrelated to many of the other pressure points which we also track. So it is complex and it does vary around the globe. We divide our findings into four regions and we see a variety of actors at work in each of these uh, situations different structural forces at work, and they produce unique dynamics, but there are similarities which will hopefully allow um, the implementation of um, some focused recommendations. Um, we also would not want to discount the fact that many of these things are exacerbated by conflict situations, in each of these regions, and this has already been recognized. In terms of recommendations, I will just leave you with some links to our formal recommendations. Um, as, a, uh, as a civil society group, Open Doors is always encouraging local faith actors in these recommendations that you see on the screen, and we have developed specific programs and means of doing so. However, for government bodies, 
and uh, other agencies, we have special specific recommendations for the country of Nigeria and in the back of our annual report, we also have more global recommendations with respect to uh, protecting the intersection of FORB and women's rights and those individuals who are touched by this. Thank you everyone for your time and thank you uh, Special Rapporteur um, Obokato for the work that you are doing for these populations. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Fisher, Helen, uh, for your remarks and for your campaign to strengthen resilience of women and men experiencing religious persecution and for your action uh, with open doors. Uh, I think it's very, very important and very impressive. And uh, indeed, we should always uh, highlight the practical contribution of faith-based organizations on behalf of uh, the prevention, but also rehabilitation of uh, 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 human trafficking victims. Uh, then I'm not certain who is our next speaker. Yes, he's here. Good, good to see you, Teyai Pam. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, your face on the screen. You're the leader of uh, uh, diaspora engagement with the uh, International Committee on Nigeria, ICON. Uh, you were born and raised in Nigeria. You attended the undergraduate university in Nigeria, but uh, were privileged to complete your master's development uh, uh, economics at the Hell of School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University in the US in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, through your career, you have been impassionate. We need passionate people. Uh, we have been passionate people to seek a better Nigeria and better world. Uh, you have led and partnered with others to launch empowerment initiatives and development programs across Africa. Mr. Pam, we now welcome you to share your remarks. You have the floor. Um, thank you, His Excellency, and for that, for those beautiful words, and thank you to the Jubilee campaign team and everybody that has contributed and is contributing to this challenge that we have in Nigeria. So I am um, from the International Committee on Nigeria and the International Committee on Nigeria ICON um, advocates for um, human rights in Nigeria and the need for every Nigerian to live as freely as possible as a free Nigerian to practice their faith and to pursue um, um, whatever dreams, goals, and aspirations that they desire for themselves to grow. Um, in regards to the challenge of modern slavery and ransoms in Nigeria, we, we know that and we understand that the United States of America and especially the Western world, you know, they rise up for causes of female and sex slavery, human trafficking and gender discrimination, but are oblivious to the cases in Nigeria, which is most likely beyond the numbers and incidents in, in, in the US, Europe and the UK combined. Um, for example, we, we, uh, we know about Leah Sharibu and how she has been taken. You know, she was taken at the age of 14 and has been a captive for nearly four years now. Um, Patience Ishaku, another person, um, was 21 years old when she was um, abducted by Boko Haram on Christmas Eve in 2019. And we, we are certain of even the case with the Chibok girls, over 100 Chibok girls remain captive for over seven years. Um, we need the world to hear about these girls and women who remain in captivity and how others continue to be captured for vile purposes by Islamic terrorists and militants. So the, the, the emphasis has been on Boko Haram, but the truth is the Fulani mil militia has also been very, very involved in this and uh, kidnappings and slavery of women and girls in Nigeria. Um, I have a personal story about that. Um, my, my cousin who um, was attacked by the Fulani uh, militia 
her daughter, who was six years old, was kidnapped. And um, kidnapping by the Fulani milice has, has, has become um, uh, a financial lifeline um, for them, where they kidnap these girls and these women and force them into um, sex slaves in Nigeria and then demand ransoms from, from family members who would sell everything they, they own to make sure that they get their, their mother, their wife, or, or their daughters. Um, this has become a norm now and is growing rapidly in Nigeria. These slaves are forced to endure horrendous abuse and physical mistreatment. The Christian girls are forced to convert to a religion not their own, Leah, for example, is still um, a slave because she chooses to remain a Christian. In July 2021, Joe Parkinson, the Africa Baru chief for the Wall Street Journal, reported that since the start of 2021, there were over 3,000 kidnappings um, in Nigeria. If we were to calculate for July through September, 500 per month. That will be over 4,500 kidnappings just this year. No longer are these only perpetrated by Boko, Boko Haram, like I said, um, but increasingly it is the Fulani militants who are overtaking the kidnapping industry. Ransoms range from a few thousand US dollars to over hundreds of thousands of dollars. And one state reported that there have been over $5 million paid this year alone. Icon estimates that the average ransom is about 10,000 US dollars each, and that, and that over 2,500 kidnappings have been per perpetrated this year, specific, specifically targeting Christians. That means that there has been over $25 million has been paid as a ransom to either Boko Haram or the Fulani militants. The Christian community is suffering both um, financially, physically, but also spiritually. The impact of kidnappings and ransom payments is impoverishing those local communities so that they are unable to pay local pastors, conduct benevolence projects, invest in local farming, and, con and consequently prevent the sustainability of local communities. Um, based on statistics of, of about 2,500 victims um, have been kidnapped. Estimates of kidnapping, trafficking, and slavery are in the thousands. The Nigerian government has failed to stop Boko Haram or the Fulani militants in their efforts to brutally annihilate um, the Christians and those who, who, are not, who are not sympathetic to their cause. That is to say that um, the Christians are not just the victims in this situation, but other people from other religions um, that are not sympathetic to their cause are also victims of these kidnappings. Over 2,500 um, women and girls kidnapped in 2021. Um, 2,500 kidnappings have been um, perpetrated this year, specifically targeting Christians. Over 85% are from Christian communities and 25 million in ransom in this year, 2021. The estimated amount of ransoms paid in 2021, over 25 million. Um, it is sad to say that there has been zero court cases in this regard. There are absolutely no court cases that have been tendered against perpetrators of kidnapping and slavery. Either family members do not feel they will produce any result um, or there, there has been zero arrest against key perpetrators. Um, Sometimes in these attacks that happen, especially in communities, even when people are arrested, it's easy for them to, to get released. Um, and it has been a hopeless situation, and that's probably why people are not moving forward to the courts to um, lay any cases. Um, we have certain recommendations that we would like to share. We appeal to the Nigerian government and the global community to fight for the human rights um, of all people, especially those enslaved in Nigeria, women and girls especially, who are kidnapped and forced um, into all these violent acts um, against their will. We appeal to the wall because um, all lives matter. We believe that adding voice, voices to ours can help free those who are in bondage and in fear of their lives. 
Ransoms range from a few thousands to over hundreds of thousands of dollars. And one state reported um, spending over $5 million um, in, in ransoms. Um, we, we, we therefore ask individual organizations and institutions to issue a public statement decrying the capture and enslavement of uh, women and children, whether Christian or, or Muslims, um, by jihadist militants in Nigeria, um, to work with organizations like us um, to employ the power of the United States by force or diplomacy to emancipate um, these girls and these women, um, to help us educate the American public about the plight of people in Nigeria, women and children, especially girls, both Muslim and Christians, who are being slaughtered, enslaved, and trafficked by religious supremacists. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you very much, Terry uh, uh, Pam. Mr. Pam, uh, I would like to congratulate you for your commitment for uh, human rights of all people in Nigeria and especially people victim uh, of uh, abduction. And uh, my best wishes for your uh, difficult uh, task. Uh, and now I would like uh, to introduce our next speaker, the next speaker also from Nigeria, who will be providing her remarks via a pre recorded video uh, but uh, we'll be trying to connect uh, live virtually as well. And this is Mrs. Fatima Njoku, lawyer and advocacy director of uh, uh, Stefanos Foundation based in Jos, Nigeria. Stefanos Foundation is a human rights advocacy, relief, rehabilitation and reconstruction organization that works to help victims of aggression and those suffering discrimination simply for being Christian in Nigeria by providing intelligence gathering, leadership training, trauma healing, and services for internally displaced persons camps. Stefanos Foundation creates awareness both locally and internationally on persecutions of Christians and networks with other organizations, such as the Christian Association of Nigeria and other Christian ministries. We will now play Mrs. Njoku's pre-recorded statement. Please. Thank you so much for having me. So as, as I've been introduced, I work with Stephanos Foundation and Stephanos Foundation is a human rights organization in Nigeria. We work to help um, victims of violence through many ways. We offer psychosocial therapy, we offer relief, we do advocacy, and that's the aspect I'm going to be dwelling on today. So in the years of our work with victims of uh, violence, and particularly those who have been displaced, of course, many people have been displaced due to the ongoing violence in Nigeria different parts of Nigeria. Most of displaced people are internally displaced, while a few have left the country and are refugees. So we'll be dwelling on those who are within the country. Many of the internally displaced people suffer a lot of challenges. Um, I go, I'm going to take an example of the internally displaced persons camp that my office opened in 2014 in Jos. We realized that when the camp was opened, a lot of people came in, of course, first to support, to offer the kind of the help they can, you know, contribute their, you know, different kinds of help, giving food and all that. But then there were a lot of people who also came there solely for the purpose of trying to adopt some of the children or take them as domestic servants. That's a very bad situation. But in a situation where criminal gangs have this kind of people and then they, they, there's no opportunity for them for civil societies like us to come in between to say no you can't do that to these people you can't take them as servants and just enslave them and all that when they're in the 
camps and in all those places, there is no advocacy for them. There is nobody speaking for them. And so they're at the mercy of the criminal gang. Remembering the Chibok abductions, it was clear from what Boko Haram said that they were going to marry off these girls and there was nothing that was going to happen. And of course they did that, they married off a lot of them. Some are still coming, we're finding that even those that have been recovered recently came back with children, with husband and all of that. The role of the government, primary purpose of government is security and welfare of the people. In situation where people are increasingly being abducted, massive and mass abductions, and then these people are subjected to all kinds of inhumane treatment. They are not well fed. There was a video I saw where one of the students that was captured by one of these militant groups, they were drawing all kinds of very painful marks that was bringing out blood and the child was screaming. And that, was, that video was done simply to show to people that they need to pay ransom, these people need to be you know, taken out of captivity, but ransom has to be paid. And these kind of things are happening in this country where we have a government in place. At a time when all this situation is happening, these things are happening, you hear the federal government saying that they have, they have forgiven repentant Boko Haram. And then you begin to wonder, what is the criteria for forgiving repentant Boko Haram, for forgiving repentant terrorists? And then the military that is rehabilitating these people, what competence do they have to rehabilitate these kinds of terrorists when the internally displaced persons are there suffering all kinds of inhumane treatment by criminal gangs, by members of the society. And there are even allegations of officials of internally displaced camps taking advantage of internally displaced people. This is a very serious situation that we believe very strongly that needs with these kinds of intervention, talking about it and international engagement. I remember that there were two different situations that just happened recently, where separatist agitators, the Sunday Boho and Kanu, Nandi Kanu, who were people who left the country our uh, government was able to trace them for Kanu Namdi was partitioned back into the country. The Boho, they were able to trace him in Benin Republic and so many things that happened to bring them back. It tells me that our government has the capacity to trace all these bandits, all these militant Fulani headsmen that are attacking places. They have all the capacity to bring them, but they're not doing that. I don't know if it's because they don't have the political will to do so, or is it because because they have some form of affinity, tribal affinity or religious affinity to these groups. But I believe very strongly that the right things are not being done to bring these people to justice so that these things can stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it was very impressive, uh, uh, Mrs. Njoku. And uh, um, my best wishes also for all. Oh, here you are, good. Uh, um, for thank you for not only for your statement but also for your action uh, uh, for on behalf of victims of uh, religious persecution in Nigeria and especially uh, for uh, IDPs. Now uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Father uh, Joseph Batio Fidelis, a priest of the Catholic uh, Diocese of Maiduguri in Nigeria. Father Fidelis has been outspoken on religious persecution of Christians, in particular their vulnerability to attacks by Boko Haram, and has called on Western nations to intervene to stop the atrocities. Father Fidelis is the director of the Justice Development and Peace Commission of the Diocese of Maiduguri, and he has used assistance from aid to the church in need to build a trauma and resource center for displaced persons in the diocese. Father Fidelis also currently ministers to women in these refugee camps who are survivors of attacks by Boko Haram 
and the Islamic state in the West African province. Father Fidelis, we now turn to you. Thank you for taking the floor. Thank you very much. I am Father Fidelis Joseph, and um, I want to thank the, Your Excellency for introducing me, and to thank the Jubilee Campaign also for making this platform available for us to speak on the experiences and what we go through as locals here. I am a priest and a clinical psychologist, and I work in my degree in Borno State, and I help the victims of uh, Boko Haram violence. And as most of us know, I wouldn't go into the long details of about Boko Haram East Wap and uh, what the Fulani people are doing. But I will just go straight uh, to the action and the help that we do. Currently, with the help of Aid to the Church in Need International, we have been able to build a little trauma healing center situated in Maiduguri. And we are currently undertaking also a community based. We, we cannot listen, we cannot hear you, Father. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, good. Please, thank you. And uh, under the Justice Development and Peace Commission, we carry out awareness, sensitization, trauma healing, uh, psychosocial support activities, occupational therapy and vocational therapy, especially for women and young girls who are victims of this attack. And most of them are already internally displaced persons who have also received various forms of attacks, abuses, and torture. And I want to thank uh, the United Nations and especially for this side event to highlight the suffering of women and young girls because in the event of war and crisis as it is constantly in Northeast Nigeria and other parts of Nigeria, women and young girls suffer a double tragedy. While we know, and it has been highlighted, the motives for which these groups operate, we know that strongly there is the move for religious conversion and most of the victims that we have met to speak to them and to assist and accompany them, most of them have been asked to forcefully change their own religion. Many of these victims have served as sex slaves. Some of them even have children for the, ex, for the combatants. Some of them carry out domestic servitude like washing of clothes, cleaning, fetching water, and even so, sometimes working in the bushes on the farms of these armed groups. Sadly, some of them also are used for commercial purposes. And two motives are here. For the commercial purpose, sometimes some of them are sold into the neighboring country of Chad and Niger, while all that who are kept behind, ransom is being asked upon them that their families have to pay huge amount of money. And that money is often channeled into the purchase of arms and other heinous crimes. So what then is our own experience with these victims of this attack? While in captivity, they are often repeatedly tortured, beaten, starved, and raped. When sometimes they escape from captivity, as I have met more than eight of them just recently, about eight of them, and we are working with them. When they have escaped from slavery or from these at attacks, they also suffer social stigma. So they have a double kind of suffering that they undergo. The post-traumatic stress disorder or the symptoms, and then the social stigma of not being socially accepted into their communities. What we have recently, recently, a survey was carried out by a North, Northeast Protection Working Group, and children were asked, and I will just read the responses of the children. For the boys, this was the response. They said they fear being abducted by armed groups, they fear being kidnapped by criminal gangs, and fear of being killed by the insurgents. For the girls, interestingly, the first thing they mentioned was sexual violence. Second thing was abduction and the third thing, fear of being killed. Imagine the harm that this already is causing in the minds of these young people. Lately, two days ago, three days ago, the government came out to speak strongly on the activities of these armed groups and how it is also impacting on the education of young children. 
over 12 million children are out of school. And so if these children fear being killed, sexually violated, trafficked, and sold out even outside Nigeria, imagine the harm that is causing to their minds currently and how much it is depleting the hope and the possibility of these children going back to school, building a future and what can be of the country. As an organization with very little resources because sometimes we do not have big people who support the activities we do. And sadly so, because of the COVID, maybe I couldn't even meet very big names that are in my degree and very few organizations want to partner with faith-based organizations, very few of them. We have been engaged in this community-based mental health and psychosocial support. Currently, we have been able to work with about 422 participants, women and girls who have adequately been uh, desensitized, been accompanied and enrolled in our services. We have trained 12 mental health officers and we have trained over 471 community-based psychosocial support group persons who are then divided in groups. And these 471 caught across Borno, Adamawa, and Yobi. Mm. What then can be done to assist these victims? While it is true that trafficking is going on because Maiduguri is bordering Chad, Niger, and part of Cameroon, victims of these abductions by these armed groups are often sold out or tortured or violated. We work on the ground there to assist some of them, to accompany them, their families, and to help in their own trauma healing. What are the recommendations that I would want to give to, the, to this uh, panel and to the bigger international bodies? No doubt, uh, over and over, there has been a call, but I want to reiterate it here, a call to have a transnational security system and network around that border, because much as we have the security outfits, uh, because of the poor situation and the porous nature of the borders, there is need to have a transnational security network that will work between Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger to prevent the trafficking line that Father Fidelis, I would like to, uh, to thank you uh, because I think we, we, we lost you, but still uh, uh, what you said is quite impressive. And uh, I would like to, uh, to thank you not only for your witness, but also for your courageous advocacy and action on behalf of uh, victims of Boko Haram. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if we cannot uh, uh, see you or hear you anymore, uh, uh, possibly you could intervene in the question and answer period. Um, and uh, if, if you don't mind, um, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor now to the next speaker. And uh, 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 actually, the next speaker is also from Nigeria. Uh, it's uh, Alheri uh, Magaji. Uh, Alheri Magaji, Mrs. Magaji <laughs> is the daughter of Bawa Magaji, uh, the leader of the Adara chiefdom of Nigeria. And in 2019, in June 2019, uh, Mrs. Magaji spoke at an event uh, hosted by the Heritage Foundation, where she revealed that the predominantly Christian Adara group has suffered numerous attacks that left hundreds dead and thousands displaced. Me, Mrs. Uh, Magaji now uh, operates the Radi or Radai Foundation an organization based in Southern uh, Kaduna states that uh, focuses uh, on, uh, 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 and actually, Mrs. Magaji, if you are with us, uh, I would like to, to give you uh, uh, the floor. Uh, are you with us? Okay. If you are... Yes. Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It's an honor to be here and thank you for the introduction. Yes. Um, I'm going to try to be quick because, as we all know, Kaduna State Network has been shut down, so we get sporadic networks. Mm -hmm. So, yes, my name is Alheri Magaji. I'm the daughter of Bao Magaji, who is the Wazirin Adara. 
He's actually supposed to be the leader since our leader was killed in 2018. His killers have still not been brought to justice. And after that, uh, my people who are 95% Christian Adara have been placed under a Hausa Muslim Emir. So things are really difficult for us. And then in the midst of all this, we have kidnappings every day, every day. Just yesterday, we met a girl, a lady. She's a widow. Her husband was killed in the crisis last year. She was, um, we actually empowered her and then she was kidnapped and she said she was there for a week and her family had to pay 500,000 Naira for her to be, as ransom for her to be released. And she was raped every day. So when we talk to victims, we realize that every time they're kidnapped, sometimes they're not even kidnapped for ransom. They're kidnapped to uh, cook for the Fulani herdsmen who kidnapped them. They are kidnapped for sexual um, activities. Most of them, even the kids, are raped. On July 5th of this year, in 2021, 121 students were kidnapped while they were in school. I mean, there's not supposed to be any safer place for you to be than in school or your homes. But those are the most vulnerable places for my people right now. We have people kidnapped every day from home. And that aside the people being kidnapped on the road. Those of you familiar with Kaduna know the road from Kaduna through Southern Kaduna to Plateau State is one road. And that's where almost everybody follows. Just on Sunday, a cousin of mine was kidnapped too on that same place, like it's on the road. And because of the shutdown of network, it's hard for people these days to call for help. There was an attack in Jankasta in Zengong in Southern Kaduna last week. For three hours, the, the attacks were going on. on innocent people while they slept and they couldn't call for help in three hours later when the carnage had been done. And when you talk to the government, they tell you it was a, a clash. It's not a clash. How is it a clash when people are sleeping and you attack them while they sleep and then the government calls it a clash. But why my foundation operates is because we realize the victims are left to themselves. These women and kids who are being raped, nobody takes care of them. They're released, those who are lucky, who aren't killed, they have to go back by themselves. A lot of the things I wanted to say, Te and um, Njoku from Joss said a lot. It's kind of similar from what, what my people are going through. And I'm just speaking for the other people. This is across Southern Kaduna. And we started talking earlier because we knew it was going to escalate to other parts of the state. So right now, even the Northern parts are not left out. Birningwari is not left out. Lere is not left out. Nobody sleeps well in Kaduna State right now. I can tell you that for a fact. Whatever it is they write in the newspapers, nobody sleeps with their eyes closed in Kaduna State. Even in the city, you're sleeping, the kidnappers come at night. They kidnap you from home and the security forces won't do anything about it. But our main concern are the displaced people, the internally displaced people. They have absolutely nowhere to go to. We've had cases where people's limbs have had to be cut off because they got rotten because they had less than a dollar to go to the hospital. So we're advocating that the government, at the very least, if they say that the bandits in court, as what they call them, but the victims will tell you they're Fulani herdsmen, if they've overpowered them and there's nothing they can do about that, the least they can do is to take care of the innocent victims. Nobody's taking care of them. You find um, orphans who are left at the mercy of people who you don't know if they're going to take care of them. My organization is taking care of Zipporah, Isaiah, and Isaac. They were a family of eight. And on the same night, on one night last year, their mother was killed, their father, three older siblings were killed right in front of them. They are, the last child, who was two weeks at the time, was shot three times. Who shoots at a three-week-old, two, three-week-old baby? But he's doing okay now. We've put Isaiah and Zipporah in school. They were left for dead too. But you can only imagine how their lives have changed in a night. And this is a story of so many people in my community. And we're just calling for, for them to even be recognized as victims because they're being gaslighted. The government is even, will even tell you sometimes that these things don't happen or, or I am exaggerating or my ex organization is exaggerating what is happening. They always say that, but we have facts, we have pictures, we have the people are there. They're there in the villages. Some of them cannot even go back to their villages because the Fulani herdsmen have occupied those villages. We have them in Rimo, in Kajuru, local government. So it's just a lot. I could go on and on and on, but I want to thank you for this platform. Thank you for everybody on this platform. I know a lot of people here because of what I do. 
I don't want to waste time, but thank you everybody who is here for um, escalating our voices. Thank you, Jubilee Campaign. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. It is Magaji for your statement and also for uh, your foundation, this Resilience Aid and Dialogue, Aid and Dialogue Initiative. Yes, yes sir. Yes. You can find us at www.radifoundation.org. Yes. You'll see a lot more stories on there. That's very kind of you. Yes. No, no, thank you for thank sharing you. that with us. And uh, actually, we, we were supposed to have a uh, uh, Doug Burton as the next speaker, but for okay. uh, health reasons, he's on uh, medical issues, he's unable to be with us. So uh, we are happy to have uh, 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 Dr. Gloria Puldu, uh, Mrs. Puldu, uh, very happy to, to see you. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, one of the most noteworthy stories we know regarding kidnapping and slavery of women and children in Nigeria is the story of Lia Sharibu. Lia was kidnapped in 2018 at the age of 14 by the Islamic State in Western African province, Iswap, and she remains in captivity four years later as she had refused to renounce Christianity, God bless her, and convert to Islam through recent uh, uh, reports suggest that she had done so. We are honored to welcome Dr. Gloria Puldu, founder and president of LIA Foundation, who works so tirelessly for LIA's release and has highlighted the struggles of other school children abducted and forced into marriage and servitude. And uh, Dr. Uh, you uh, previously gave a heart-wrenching testimony at the first International Religious Freedom Summit in July this year. Dr. Puldu, we now turn the floor over to you, please. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, sir. And I really appreciate um, the privilege of recognizing the little work that we do. Uh, and I also want to especially thank you, the Special Rapporteur, for giving us this platform and Jubilee Campaign. We are really grateful because this gives us the opportunity to keep amplifying um, the voices of the voiceless who are paying a great price, some of them still enslaved in captivity, like Leah Sharibu, like we had our foundation, Leah, uh, found, uh, Leah Foundation, uh, it was, was created in honor of this young child who boldly refused to renounce her Christian faith. We are so proud of what she has done and we keep speaking and encouraging other young women and young Christian girls, so whoever people of faith, you know, to stand boldly for their faith. So we advocate for Leah Sharibu, she represents all the persecuted Christian young girls and also the girls who are taken from captivity, um, are taken from their schools. And we know the issues that are happening to our school children. We also help to uh, rehabilitate and give restoration to rescued young girls and empower the widows and uh, vulnerable women who are all in societies. You know, these are some of the little works that we do. Going on to what has been happening to my country since 2009, Nigerian Islamist terrorists, which we have all been speaking about, Boko Haram Iswap, they have lead, which they literally means Western education forbidden. And so that's why we see the insistent attacks on school, making sure that women especially don't even go to the school because in their ideology, women should not be educated. They should be in the kitchen or behind, you know? So they mean Western education forbidden. And they have been waging a violent attack against the Nigerian government in the bid to impose Islamic law and even Islamic caliphate in the whole of Nigeria. So they have started their activities in 2009, even though back in the 1980s, like 83, we had a group called Metasini, who we believe are the ones that have metamorphosed into Boko Haram because they share the same ideology. And um, now it is not just about the Boko Haram, like one of our uh, panelists shared, we have the Fulani headsmen, who are rather the Fulani militia is the proper name to give them because they are very well equipped and they carry out systematic attacks, abducting and kidnapping, just like Alheri just mentioned some of the terrible things that they do with um, abducting of uh, 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 Christian women and 
uh, uh, girls, and not just Christian women and girls, but communities entirely displaced from North Central, uh, North Eastern part of Nigeria. So we can see that, in fact, even the West Southern part of Nigeria now is paying a great price with the activities of the Fulani militia. So, and they are doing similar things with the Boko Haram, you know? So for us, we believe strongly that uh, all these criminal groups, whether it is Boko Haram, whether it's ISWAP, whether it is uh, Fulani militia, whether it is bandits, whether it is a uh, gun or non government whatever name they give them, or the coloration, they, they have the same agenda behind them because in their activities, they always, you know, mention that they are, and they don't hide it, they mention that their intention is to ensure that they Islamize Nigeria and they establish a, an Islamic caliphate in Nigeria. So these groups are the same. They go about kidnapping and destroying communities, killing husbands, killing men, killing uh, 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 young men, or you know, abducting them and conscripting them into or enlisting them into Boko Haram if they are uh, willing to. If they are not willing to, then they are killed. And what do they do with our women? They keep our women enslaved. They keep our women in slavery and cause them to do all those terrible, terrible things that Father um, Joseph mentioned about forcing them to convert, forcing them into uh, marriages that are called forced marriage. And I'm glad yesterday somebody enlightened us about it's not forced marriage. And I believe that. Why will it be forced? If it is marriage, it shouldn't be forced. And that's another issue for another day. But then they force them to give birth. Like now we hear that Leah Sharibu has given birth to two children. We have met with one lady that has just been released from captivity about two months ago. She met with Leah, so we are glad Leah is alive. But you know, um, there are so many Christian girls, so many Christian women who are back in captivity, according to this young lady that is uh, was released recently, and so. They just keep giving birth to, uh, to uh, these so-called husbands in captivity. And so as far as we are concerned, Boko Haram, all these groups are just systematically abducting our girls, converting them, forcing them to Islamize them and to make sure that they keep increasing in their activities. From the report of UNICEF, the criminal gangs have abducted like 1,436 children with about 16 of them dead in 2021, according to the report that Jubilee even also gave, and over 200 of them are still missing. International Committee on Nigeria also uh, gave a report in 2020, 2,557 individuals are abducted. All these abductions are mostly done in Christian areas. And uh, I'm not saying that other people are not abducted, but when they are abducted, we see that they are released and then the Christian people are kept back until heavy ransoms are paid, like somebody has also mentioned. And the problem that is happening with our, what we are doing is that all these things are on the increase. And it is very unfortunate that um, the government is doing nothing about it. Uh, let me quickly run to some of the things that I want to suggest that we do. Uh, but one thing that I want to emphasize is that all the female enslavement that have been happening involves you know, uh, sexual um, and uh, psychological abuse, deprivation, torture, long time and repeated trauma. So all these victims, when they come out and we are helping them, we see that they exhibit things that are long time traumas that take a long time to you know, uh, uh, help them to restoration. And then I also want to emphasize that 90% of women and girls who are currently enslaved in the hands of Boko Haram are Christian women. They are forced to convert and they are made to give birth. So these are some of the things that I want to emphasize. And so I will also want to emphasize that these criminal groups, they don't deny what they have been doing. We have other people giving 
different narratives that they are just skirmishes in the north or farmer headers. These are wrong narratives. What is happening is systematic attack on Christian communities abducting these men and enslaving them. That is one part that I also want to emphasize. And there are so many YouTube videos in the media of Boko Haram leadership making direct threats against Christians, you know? And uh, in, 2020, uh, in 2012, there was a video released. We could check, uh, check it out. And they said clearly their intention is to make sure that they give alternate uh, three days alternative for Christians to leave the north. If not, they are all going to destroy them. In 2014, they also released an, uh, a video and they say Allah says we should finish them all. And that is one thing that I don't think anybody should be in contention with. And in 2018, uh, the video that they released about Leah and other Chibo girls, we know all is to uh, force Christian girls and to make sure that Christianity does not uh, move on in Nigeria. Let me just run to recommendations, two or three, because of time. First of all, I would like to ask the Nigerian, uh, I would like to ask the United Nations to uh, ensure that they pressure the Nigerian government to harmonize the national with the international law on rights of women and girls so that they can be held accountable when crimes are committed against women. The International Criminal Court should monitor and evaluate Nigeria's capacity to hold perpetrators of abuses and sexual vi uh, violence against women and girls. Because we know that the US Security Council Resolution 1325, 1820, 1888, and 1889 have object, uh, objectives on protecting women from violence and conditions of armed conflicts like Boko Haram insurgency, Fulani uh, and banditry and all sorts of things that are happening in Nigeria. But these resolution, uh, resolutions have not led to the United Nations to respond to the abduction and the rescue of women and girls, especially Leah Sharibu, Chibok girls and all these young Christian girls that are in captivity. So we demand that these issues should be seen. And then state accountability for citizens' welfare is a major challenge. So for us as women, we don't uh, understand why, we don't understand peace and security when people are saying there's peace and security and uh, stability should be put in place by the government. We don't experience that. So the state government should be held rest, uh, accountable and Nigerian government must be pressured to prioritize the rescue and return of all abducted girls. So let me stop there. And I will send my paper to uh, you later so that it can you know, be shared if you want, because I have so many recommendations. Thank you very much. I think I've taken too long. Thank you, sir. Sorry oh. for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Pudu. Uh, uh, you're the founder and president of the LIA Foundation. Thank you for your powerful testimony and your very interesting recommendations and tireless action. Thank and uh, uh, now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sayo Ajiboye. Uh, the next speaker is indeed Dr. Olu Wasayo Ajiboye, founder and director of Mission Africa International. He's also the president of Redeemed Christian Bible College and Seminary. Mission Africa International is a nonprofit organization that advocates on behalf of the persecuted victims of religiously motivated violence in West Africa. Mission Africa International also seeks to facilitate mentoring and educational interventions for the development of Africa as a whole. Dr. Ajiboye also has participated as a speaker in Jubilee Campaign's parallel event on Nigeria at the Human Rights Council. Dr. Adiboye, uh, we welcome you to speak. You have the floor. Oh, it is a privilege to be here. And I thank the, <clears throat> the, uh, your excellency, Vite. I thank the special rapporteur. Um, and I thank uh, 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 Ms. Bolwalda and Jubilee Campaign. Uh, most of the people that are talking are colleagues. So I would not go over the things they have said. We, they have brought the truth. As late as two weeks ago, my team was still in Benue State 
And we discovered that 20 kilometer stretch between the borders of Benue and the borders of another state called Nasarawa has been evacuated. You can't find one village in that stretch. Why? Because of Fulani militia. In, in, in one uh, location with five IDP camps, we have 1,000 children in each of the IDP camps. <laughs> we, our question is, what is the hope of those children? We, we, what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, wait and later do exactly the same thing that uh, Clinton did uh, uh, with the Rwandan uh, genocide? Because what we are facing is nothing less than a genocide. It is not just in the North Central. We walk in Adamawa, we walk in Benue, we have walked in Zamfara. All the Christian villages in Zamfara has been evacuated and neutralized. So, and we, we want it to be clear that this is um, not a farmer ada conflict. This, like the Dr. Pudu said, is an attempt to create a caliphate. So what the main point I would like to make is that the recommendation of the special rapporteur can form a structured peg on which global action to stem this criminal activities, especially as it regards women and children, can hang. Now, these recommendations are critical, uh, but it must be approached from very nuanced perspective. It must be approached diplomatically. And when you look at what is happening in Nigeria, we cannot run away from the fact that the state is coddling actors of violence against women and children. The state is protecting either overtly or covertly the perpetrators of violence against women and children. And it, it is a big question that must be addressed, that the criminal enslavement of women and children is a function of the refusal of the state, the Nigerian state, to act in a, in a truly decisive manner against the perpetrators of, uh, um, of, of, of against the perpetrators of violence against women and children. And, and we must find a way to disincentivize the critical actors within the Nigerian nation state. We must find a way to remove their influence so that they are no longer able to, um, to, to, to impact on what is happening on the ground. We must, actually, however, avoid the tendency to uh, swipe everybody with the same color because it, it's not so. It's not everybody that should be um, swiped with the same color. We, this, the, the international community must find a way to isolate the perpetrators and name them and prosecute them. We have said this ad nauseum, uh, the Magnitsky Act and what, what not. What we discovered is that when this, this actor that have, ab, uh, that have essentially taken the government apparatus hostage, when they are not confronted and uh, uh, the, we just talk about it, they become even more power, empowered and they become uh, very insensitive and they feel like there's nothing anybody can do for them. And they, they carry on in their nefarious uh, ways. So 
those that have the capacity, the legal capacity, must give heat to um, laws, to international uh, covenants and uh, international agreements that will go after individuals that are perpetrating. And we know these people. We know them. The people that matters know them. Just like in the Rwandan uh, genocide, the state, the American state knew what was going to happen. And I am pleading that we would not go into that same mode fought nearly how many years later? 30, nearly 30 years later. We are pleading with those that have capacity to please hear the voice of all these people that are bringing a witness. We bring a witness, not only, we, we bring a witness from across board. You're talking about the recent Baptist abduction in Kaduna State. Some of those children are in a house that I stayed in in September after they were released. I came to Nigeria. I met those, I mean, I was in that house where the children were transported across the nation. No, no, no care whatsoever, no care, no care by the government, only um, people of goodwill are standing up and their parents are standing up. Finally, um, I, we must commend the church and partner more with those that are actually serving these children. An organization like Gloria, like Aleri, and like Icon, those are the organ, like Stephanos Foundation. When I go to Nigeria and I hear the amount of money that the Western world pours into Northern Nigeria, it is scandalous. Millions, nearly billions of dollars. And the people really doing the job, they do not see a penny of the money. The money goes right back to the perpetrators. I thank you once again, Ms. Buwada. I thank uh, the, the special rapporteur, and I thank the Order of Malta for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abi Ajiboye, for your strong words. And you're right to ask for action against so many crimes. And uh, I can hear what you're saying in uh, asking uh, for preventing uh, a, a genocide, possibly an ongoing genocide. And uh, <clears throat> I understand also the role of uh, the special rapporteur. And uh, I hope that we can ask uh, him to, to take the floor after. Uh, uh, I would like now still to ask uh, <clears throat> Father uh, Fidelis, uh, to conclude his statement because uh, we uh, uh, had him cut uh, for uh, technical reasons. Uh, and uh, Father Fidelis, if you are with us, uh, we uh, would be happy to give you the floor now. Uh, thank you very much. I, I believe you hear me now. We, we hear you very clearly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that for technical support, I, I couldn't finish. I want to thank other people who have spoken and I, I really resonate with what they have said. We work as local people here on ground and we see a lot of the horrors and the abuses that have been perpetrated by these groups, be they Boko Haram, Islamic State of West African Province, Fulani militia. Part of also what I wanted to recommend here before the network went out was a kind of collaboration. We know that it is good to work with the government, but these groups also take advantage of the weak governance in the system. And so when the government is weak, they take advantage of this. 
So while also the United Nations and other international agencies and bodies are working with our government, which is very good, it is also important to collaborate with civil society organizations and other organizations that are already working on ground to see how they can expedite the work. I was speaking also, and I want to make it very clear here, part of the problem within the country is the proper designation of the groups that carry out this, because what name or nomenclature is given to such groups determines what action and what the law can take to deal with the crime they perpetrate. If, for instance, the group is only known as unknown gunmen, there is no enough ground or justification to criminalize their activities. And I want to thank the uh, special repertoire who gave his, his, uh, who spoke about the nature of these groups. In Nigeria, a lot of these groups hide under religion, and we know how much religion is very sensitive when it comes to talk about matters like this. Mm -hmm. We must isolate designate, prosecute, and speed up the process of criminalizing and prosecuting these groups. So it's one of the very big recommendations I want to make. Then I am sure also in the preparation of this platform, there has been mentioned by the uh, special repertoire about this victim fund. Access to such fund or access to other UN agencies to collaborate with such organizations as the ones we work is very limited. We have limited access to such funds. Where those funds go back to, we do not know. And our eyes are not just because they are going on funds. For charity's sake, we work to bring back life to these people. And it is important then that access is granted to, to us to carry out such things. Then a system or a kind of a, 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 a base, has, I recommend also a base be created where different partners who work especially in the area of human trafficking, modern slavery, and other forms of crimes against women and children, these groups come together to see what solutions they can proffer. And here then I want to recommend a collaboration among the groups, a platform where they work together, especially to combat crime, to help in the area of education, and to curb and the, the crimes in the society while creating awareness and sensitizing, sensitizing the general public. So thank you very much. And thank you to all those who have spoken. And thank you once more for giving me the opportunity to finish the recommendations I want to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. you no, know, it was very important that uh, you had this opportunity to finish your statement. And actually, uh, you were confirming what both uh, uh, Dr. Puldu and Dr. Ajiboye were saying. Um, I may say, I, I see there are two two kind of uh, or two uh, special approaches. One uh, approach would be uh, the criminal prosecution of traffickers, and as you know, this uh, should be done definitely at the domestic level. But if it's not possible at the domestic level, then uh, possibly it should, could be done also at the international level. And as you know, some of those uh, uh, criminals are also traveling, so they might be prosecuted in, in other countries uh, outside of Nigeria, could be prosecuted in, in Europe, could be prosecuted in the US and other countries. Uh, and uh, uh, the ICC, uh, I may say it's a big question whether the International Criminal Court could uh, uh, take such uh, 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 claims, but uh, uh, that's uh, to be considered. And second approach, of course, is the protection and, uh, of and assistance of victims and also uh, the prevention of human trafficking. And uh, then uh, I understand that uh, many people uh, were asking uh, uh, what is being done uh, for the protection of, uh, of uh, uh, vulnerable uh, population, what is being done for uh, uh, those IDPs was uh, those people uh, without food, shelter, and education. And uh, uh, so I understand also that people wonder why, and this is a question by Rebecca Daly, the Nigerian government is empowering the repented Boko Haram and Fuladi Herzman with a lot of things, but neglects the survivors. What will the UN do to help us? So. I'm not the UN, 
and even, uh, uh, but still it's a, a legitimate question. I will not uh, uh, say anything against uh, the repented uh, uh, traffickers, because I think it's good that they are repenting, that they are going out of this uh, criminal activity. Uh, but uh, uh, now, um, I must say, it was quite impressive to have all those statements, and uh, we uh, could uh, definitely uh, uh, we could definitely uh, take some more uh, questions. You know that uh, you could uh, uh, have uh, the opportunity to write questions in uh, uh, in the Q and R question. I had also another question of Mrs. Rebecca Daly saying uh, she has an organization, uh, Center for Caring, Empowerment, and Peace, uh, which has reintegrated uh, 400 women and girls who were in Boko Haram captivity. Uh, she trained uh, 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 also some of them in, in skill acquisition centers. Uh, she received the uh, Sergio Vera de Melo Award you made an award in 2017, uh, but uh, uh, she was threatened and uh, she uh, is now in the US. Uh, and uh, she's saying uh, we need more help for those vulnerable people. So I don't know who will be <coughs> uh, asking other questions or who will be trying to make remarks and questions. But Anne um, Buwaldad, you have a, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, do, you, do you want to say something uh, about this, or shall we give the floor to one of the uh, uh, to some the panelists? And of course, beginning with uh, uh, Professor Obakata. Uh, I don't know. I think you are still with us. But uh, and what is uh, your advice on this? Yeah, I would again like to thank all the speakers. This has been. Uh, remarkably productive. And I definitely appreciate all of the contributions, particularly the personal uh, impacts. It seems many of those uh, on this panel this morning who, who, who physically live in Nigeria have been personally impacted in their families. And it makes the illustration of what's taking place there's so much more dramatic from the standpoint it's not a large panel but we've we've had a number of folks whose whose personal relatives have been kidnapped and this is intolerable for any country with uh, an otherwise functioning government to be permitting this level of of banditry and i think in many ways targeted persecuting persecution taking place. Um, it actually reveals that Nigerian government isn't as functional as it likes to believe it is, because this is so widespread um, in, in the Northeast and Northern uh, areas of Nigeria. It's, it's, it's not tolerable for any country. And so I do appreciate all the contributions made and we need to continue to do whatever we can to um, press the Nigerian government to make changes. And so um, I'd also like to, to hear particularly the questions that were placed in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, the special rapporteur has any uh, responses to questions posed and or recommendations made, uh, would be great to hear from you as well. Thank you for your remarks at the start of the program, but also if you have, uh, recommendations that you wish to feature or responses to those who posted items in the chat. I would love to hear from you now as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Anne. And actually, I, I would like now to ask uh, Professor Bokata, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery for, for his comments. Thank you. The first of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists for like uh, sharing their stories and like uh, 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 this, uh, giving uh, me that kind of in-depth insight and picture and, uh, as to what happens in terms of like who are involved uh, and how they are being exploited, who are being targeted. And, and all of these are well documented, but I, I, I think it is important for me to be able to uh, listen to people actually in a field working in or, or victims and survivors, and as well as those who are kind of trying to help them. 
uh, 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 one way or another. And it, it is that, you know, uh, it, it, I have to say there's no specific recommendation. You know, all of these recommendations have been made. My predecessor actually have been to Nigeria before. Uh, uh, dealing with the issue of human trafficking and, and slavery, and we, are, we keep making a, a kind of a similar recommendations over and over and, and, and over. And I think it's one of the, the difficulty here is, is uh, as some um, highlighted, is the governance, rule of law, uh, and, and strong governance, especially at the law enforcement level, is that seem to be uh, you know uh, need, need, require uh, improvements in that regard. So I think, as I said, uh, 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 corruption and obstruction of justice and this seems to be a kind of a, a key issues and i think there's lots of different ways to tackle those uh, for example we have to look at the root causes of corruption why 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 do they collaborate with criminals uh, uh, criminal groups and uh, such as poverty and lack of uh, training and, and lack of like a, a, a sufficient prosecution and punishment on, on the ground i mean all of this has to happen uh, on, on a ground level, but it's, that's easier said than done, I, I think. I mean, how, so how do you uh, uh, deal with uh, corrupt police officers and, and, and border guards and, and so on? And I, I think that's, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Uh, again, prosecution punishment is you know, easier said than done, but it has to kind of, a, a, again, from a, a, a training uh, and, and raising awareness among, uh, among these and trying to uh, and address Okay, and if they want money, then is there anything that can be done to enhance, the, for example, the salary, uh, the pays, uh, wages of all these workers working in a field? I mean, and, and all of these are kind of one you know, and aspects of it. I, 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 I'm sure, but again, it's one of that the global thoughts. I mean, it's always difficult to you know provide higher and uh, higher wages for, for these workers, and you know, at the same time, uh, in, in any event. So, so I think there's no, I don't think there's an easy answer to it, but I think it's, it has to start from stronger uh, uh, legislation, prosecuting and punishing uh, 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 obstruction of justice and, and, and corruption is, is important, as well as, as uh, again, has been highlighted, prosecuting and punishing all these groups who actually uh, you know, kidnap and exploit these uh, uh, women and, and, and girls and, and other victims is 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 is, is a, a particularly important. What can we do as a U United Nations? My role, uh, as I'm attached to the Human Rights Council, my job is to do a fact finding uh, and, and reporting. Um, so I don't have an authority to go into the field and, and start working with the governments and so on. And we are at the mercy of the governments. If they don't invite us, I can't really go in and investigate. I'm very happy to certainly go go to Nigeria and and and. and, and what I can do is I can facilitate the constructive dialogue. I think what needs to be done, which is also highlighted, I think, uh, uh, from the panelists, is the multi-agency approach, multi-stakeholder approach. It's not just I don't think the government. You know, it's it's the, it certainly Nigerian government has the primary responsibility to deal with human trafficking and, and modern slavery. There's no question about it. But I think that has to be supported from. Uh, at the civil society, you know, organizations like yourselves, as well as the United Nations, and as well as other uh, governments. So I think multi-agency, multi-stakeholder approach is uh, important. So if the Nigerian government hasn't done so already, they need to establish a, a multi-stakeholder task force where all of us, you know, and everyone can sit, sit down and discuss the issues, you know, uh, face to face. Uh, that also should also include survivors first and foremost. They need to be included in these decision-making processes. Uh, as well as well as civil society groups and, and, and United Nations agencies, I'm sure that happens at different levels. I mean, all, there are all, you know, all of these initiatives uh, already happening, and we also have a United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. I'm, I'm sure there's an, uh, a you know, regional office there in Nigeria or uh, elsewhere. So it's just that I think it is important to get that, you know, again. We have to get that appropriate government on board, uh, government agencies on board. If that's happening or not, I mean, I think I, I, I'm not too certain. Uh, if that's not happening, then if there's anything I can do to facilitate the dialogue, I'm very happy to do so. But I think you are, you know, raising all these important points about the rule of law, governance that needs to improve. I think all of these things do not happen overnight. And I think if there's anything uh, at the United Nations or, or other governments can do, like uh, UK, uh, uh, EU, uh, for that matter, uh, and United States and North America, and I think that has to be a joint effort. So, so I, you know, I think I do take your point that that needs to be done. But I'll stop there for now and they, we listen to other uh, what other people have to say uh, uh, about this as well. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bakata. 
uh, I think it's very, very, very interesting. Uh, I would say that there is also uh, another question I uh, would like to briefly uh, relay uh, that uh, does any of the findings show a link between the criminal groups of Nigeria and European trafficking? And definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, at least that was uh, one of the conclusions we had uh, in October 2019 in Paris. And we had uh, um, police officers, uh, not only from France, uh, not only from Nigeria, but also uh, from uh, 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 the Kano state. And as you know, uh, Nigeria is a federal state. And obviously, it's not only a question of, uh, uh, of Abuja, of the capital city, the federal capital city, but it's also the, the question of local authorities. Uh, and then uh, uh, how could uh, the collaboration work better uh, between uh, Nigerian um, judges or, or police officers and uh, 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 Italian, uh, French, uh, British and other um, uh, other countries um, uh, affected by uh, this trafficking um, business, I would say uh, it's difficult to say it's uh, it's not only a legal question. It's also the, the human factor is very much here because we we need uh, not only to relay messages through embassies to diplomatic services, but actually we need to bring together. Uh, uh, those various uh, people, and uh, 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 we need to bring uh, those people together so that they know each other, they trust each other, and they could uh, uh, work more effectively than, uh, unfortunately, they cannot uh, uh, do uh, 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 too often for the time being. Uh, but uh, is there any other question you see on the, uh, yeah, why is the international uh, community silent about the involvement of the present government in the Islamization of Nigeria by jihadist groups? I, uh, uh, I don't know who could answer this question. Who would I? I think, I think, I think, I think that, that's an important question. I mean, the international community is obviously it's a, it's, it's highly politicized. I mean, they are very quick in responding to well, uh, uh, I mean, making comments to us, for example, Myanmar uh, and, and other Afghanistan, but what about Nigeria and other places which are also suffering from terrorist violence and so on. And I, you know, I do take your point. I mean, why is it silent? Uh, uh, it's, it's political. But you know, I am not. I, I am an independent human rights expert. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, if you can bring that your voice to my attention through a communication and so on, I mean, you know, what at least I can do is to bring that uh, you know, highly publicize it at the international level, saying this is happening. We make statements, we uh, send the communications to the government, we publicize those. If then the government is not doing anything or government is not responding, and that is also uh, publicized. So hopefully that may kind of uh, add some kind of a, uh, well, that may encourage the government uh, uh, to do a little more. But once again, um, I'm not, you know, I don't have an authority to go in and, and investigate and, and tell them what to do. I mean, that's that's not how it works, unfortunately. I mean, that's part of the uh, uh, diplomacy that we also have to be in. But, you know, I I, I, I do think that the Nigeria deserves a, 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 a more attention, to be honest, uh, and from the international community and regionally. And one of the things you could also do is to approach European uh, so African Commission they also have a, I think it's a regional, international approach uh, is it, good, but I think more often than not, regional approach works better in, in many cases because they share common heritage. They share, they have that common understanding of some of the local issues uh, is, is, is quite important, I, I think. So there's an African Commission on Human People's, uh, People's Rights that you can kind of uh, bring to their attention that what's happening in Nigeria. And I think it's also uh, important. They also have a Europe, you know, again, African court, uh, in that regard, and then uh, you know, it's in all of that. Uh, again, this is so. There's lots of multiple uh, uh, forum. Uh, so European Commission, I mean, uh, sorry, African Commission may be in a better position than, for example, myself. But you know, I, you know, I can raise a voice at the international level to the Human Rights Council, uh, and that I can do. Uh, and I publish a report every uh, about different aspects of modern slavery, and you're more than welcome to submit information, like Nigerian uh, uh, Human Rights Commission has done. 
uh, thank, uh, you know, I very much appreciate that input to my report. And I do encourage all the stakeholders to do the same. Uh, uh, please let me know what's happening. Please let you know, uh, us know, uh, you know, so that we can reflect in reflect your voice. Thanks. So I'd like to make a comment with regard to non-governmental organizations. One of the things that Jubilee Campaign has done is we've done rejoinders when the Nigerian government has made public statements. They've even made public statements condemning uh, their own uh, uh, citizens from speaking out. And we've uh, submitted and publicized rejoinders demonstrating that the Nigerian government has not been honest and is not fulfilling its uh, duties as a government to protect its own citizens. So we have pointed out where they have um, essentially fabricated certain uh, situations that they made a claim uh, didn't exist or uh, had been somehow not published um, uh, truthfully, we show that no, in fact, um, by illustrating what has taken place in certain areas by Fulani militants or by Boko Haram or some of the other organizations that really are organized and should be investigated, including by the International Criminal Court, we've as an organization pointed that out. So has ICON. And again, we uh, appreciate ICON's contributions today. Um, our reports are essential. If we don't get these reports circulated, then the Nigerian government continues to obfuscate or otherwise essentially deny or lie or whatever. We have to keep the light shining. And so again, I appreciate all of the NGOs that are on this call. And we need to continue to expand our numbers as those of us who are doing uh, investigative work. Um, we regret one of our speakers could not attend today, uh, journalist Burton. Uh, he could not attend today, but he's done significant work as well to expose the atrocities taking place, the kidnappings taking place, and moreover, the enslavement taking place of women and girls and even boys um, there in Nigeria. So we have to keep the spotlight on. Now, um, I do think that if all uh, country delegations would take this seriously uh, and also raise their concerns with the International Criminal Court, which at this time says that they are investigating these topics uh, with regard to Islamic extremist groups, with regard to um, other types of uh, criminal networks. Uh, and we, we need to provide our reports to the International Criminal Court, but we also need to push them to go beyond investigating. It's time to bring indictments. It's time to bring serious um, efforts to hold the impunity in Nigeria to account. Uh, nation states have a duty and through the International Criminal Court, which Nigeria is a participant with, there needs to be effective tools utilized and criminal um, uh, indictments brought against those responsible. Um, also, governments have an opportunity um, on an individualized bilateral basis to bring uh, sanctions against specific Nigerian um, political persons who are, who are responsible or who, or who are not engaging in their duties to protect their citizens. Um, exposing those behind uh, definitely is an ongoing effort, but also holding them accountable once they're exposed and once they're uh, brought to um, the attention of the international community, we need to continue to do that. So my comments are all of us on the call, all those who are observing bring it to the attention of your governments to, to take action, to take sanctions against individuals or call on the International Criminal Court to bring indictments. Uh, we need to hold those responsible to account and we can do that through our governments. Uh, and if there are governments also participating or listening to uh, this program at a later date, we ask please, make an intervention to hold those uh, accountable uh, that, that are 
that are perpetrating or otherwise behind uh, these actions that are harmful to their citizens or failing to protect their citizens in Nigeria. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, and uh, I would just like to add, uh, indeed, <laughs> we were speaking of the UN uh, Human Rights Council, <laughs> you know, we, we uh, are speaking of the UN General Assembly, uh, but uh, as you all know, the UN Security Council adopted uh, uh, resolutions dealing also with the situation in, in the Sahel, uh, and uh, uh, definitely, there is no reason why uh, uh, the UN Security Council could not uh, possibly consider uh, new resolutions or implementing past resolutions. And uh, uh, as you say, uh, even uh, taking some action. Then we, we have the African Union. And don't forget that uh, Nigeria is possibly the most important member of the sub-regional organization ECOWAS. Uh, CDAO and uh, ECOWAS is, is a, a very important and well-structured uh, 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 sub-regional organization, including with uh, uh, human rights courts. And uh, uh, there you could possibly also uh, try to ask uh, this uh, sub-regional uh, uh, support. But uh, I agree with you that uh, uh, NGOs and local communities and all those people who uh, did bear witness today uh, should go on. And, and, and this message should be uh, forwarded uh, so that indeed action will be taken uh, to prevent, to protect, and also to assist victims. Uh, I think it's badly needed. And uh, Nigeria is uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, powerful, important country in Africa and in the world. Uh, so you deserve really uh, uh, to, uh, I would not say to do better, yes, but to better protect your own citizens. And uh, uh, I hope we can go on doing this. And I'm very, very grateful to, uh, to you, Anne, and to all the people from the Jubilee campaign for organizing this side event. Also very happy to see uh, uh, Professor Obakata. Um, I think it's uh, uh, only uh, uh, the beginning of, uh, uh, of a campaign and that we could move ahead. We could go on uh, with uh, this awareness raising, with this uh, uh, collection of uh, uh, good practices and with this call to action. Uh, uh, to uh, prosecute, but also to protect. So, no, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, uh, all uh, uh, speakers today. Uh, it was a very uh, moving, powerful uh, experience we had uh, uh, today, and uh, I hope we can forward this message, we can forward this call to action uh, uh, to uh, many other places, uh, but at least we we shall we shall share those messages, and uh, I would like uh, uh, personally and on behalf of the other Malta to express my uh, deep gratitude and and my best wishes uh, to everyone. Uh, beginning, of course, with our friends in Nigeria, uh, our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. You have all our sympathy and all our friendship, and we hope to do better uh, for you and with you. Thank you.